Decolonizing Nature by Adams and Mulligan presents a thoughtful contribution by both academics and conservation practitioners to the growing literature on empire and nature. It delves into practical strategies for addressing the lasting impacts of colonial conservation in both the global South and North. The book examines these legacies in settler societies at the periphery of the British Empire such as Southern Africa and Australia, as well as within the former colonial power itself. What sets this collection apart is its exploration not only of the historical ideological influence between the imperial metropole and the periphery, but also of the contemporary influence of the post-colonial periphery on the former metropole. Despite the book's title, a significant portion of its content actually focuses on the historical and contemporary colonization of nature. Contributions by Bill Adams and Val Plumwood delve into the intricate and overlapping strands of thought, underpinning colonial conceptions of nature. They shed light on the dualisms that emerged during the colonial encounter where people and nature were simultaneously conceptually separated and intertwined. Colonialists sought to sever the connections between indigenous people and their land, while dehumanizing them as primitive non-people. Another tension arose between the utilitarian desire to rationalize and control nature by taming the wilderness and civilizing people and the romantic celebrations of sublime nature that informed preservationist policies. The empirical chapters then shift to the post-colonial world, illustrating how the ideological legacies of colonialism continue to influence contemporary conservation practices. These chapters highlight how various aspects of conservation, from national parks to biodiversity conventions, are deeply embedded in European values and discourses of nature, often ignoring alternative understandings and human histories of landscapes, including supposed wilderness areas. Several contributors argue that contemporary conservation practices suffer from rigidity and lack reflexivity about their basic assumptions and practices. The preservationist ethic, seeking to separate humans and nature still endures. Even so-called community conservation falls short of granting real power to indigenous communities over the use and access to natural resources. Conservation is often conducted for or to people and their land by distant experts. While biodiversity management can be seen as a form of colonial expropriation of nature in a new guise affirming colonial dispossession and racialized patterns of resource control. These essays make an effort to explore potential paths for decolonizing attitudes towards both people and nature, while acknowledging the neocolonization of nature that has taken place. The strategies proposed range from advocating for more inclusive and ethical forms of engagement with the land, rooted in the daily practices, knowledge and needs of local communities to embracing non-equilibrial ecological processes and restorative ecology. The editors emphasize that culturally sustainable and effective conservation strategies in the post-colonial world should be emergent, localized, and diverse. However, the chapters in the collection vary significantly in style, tone, and degree of environmentalism. The editors acknowledge that contradictory ideas are expressed in the book, and they do not claim universally appropriate conservation strategies. Africanist readers might find some dissonance in the deep green eco-philosophical contributions that advocate for re-enchanting or re-mythologizing landscapes and building sensuous place attachments with storied landscapes. These ideas may resonate more with a predominantly white Australian metropolitan audience alienated from nature but might seem less relevant in rural African contexts. In these contexts, material issues such as land reform and political empowerment 
are of greater importance in any practical attempt to decolonize conservation thinking. For instance, James Murambedzi's chapter highlights the significance of land titles and economic options for Australian Aboriginal communities drawing interesting comparisons with the Southern African chapters. South Africa's example of granting land titles to communities formerly evicted from national parks mirrors Australia's approach. However, Hector Magum and James Murambedzi warn that early gains may be at risk due to inequitable negotiations over the contractual basis of these land claims and the hasty establishment of top-down transnational conservation areas in southern Africa. They also remind readers that indigenous communities may not uncritically embrace decolonized conservation strategies as local people may prioritize financial returns over symbolic rights and choose to outsource the management of their equity in protected areas to the private sector.